The old doctor fell in the well. All right, are we ready here? Good evening and uh, welcome to our latest Piedmont Laureate program. I am David Minconi, your Piedmont Laureate for 2019. And, uh, and uh, thanks, thanks for coming, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to introduce my co-panelists first. Uh, first, to my immediate left here, a man who's been on the front lines of music preservation and history in this state for well nigh 50 years, and uh, whose project from 10 years ago was kind of the uh, inspiration behind this, uh, North Carolina Arts Council Executive Director Wayne Martin. Next to him, uh, author of a forthcoming book about Earl Scruggs that I believe is going to be definitive. And uh, come to Quail Ridge Books and Music on September 23rd, and you can find out more about that. He is one of my many former bosses at the News and Observer. Journalist, historian, musician, dear friend, and hail fellow well-met, Tommy Goldsmith. Next to him, a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Carolina Chocolate Drops co-founder and Grammy Award winner, Justin Robinson. And finally, last but not least, historian and collector who's probably forgotten more about this kind of music than uh, the likes of I have ever even known about proprietor of Grammy-nominated label Old Hat Records, Mr. Marshall Wyatt. All right, it, it can be tedious if people read at you, so I promise to keep this brief. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of something that I wrote for the News and Observer 10 years ago, uh, going back to the roots of this project we're kind of gathered here to talk about tonight. Over the last three decades, Wayne Martin has made a lot of recordings in his capacity as a folklorist, and his latest batch to surface seems typical enough at first listen. 
It's a two-disc collection of old-time string band tunes, lively and loose, mostly played on fiddle and banjo. The music sounds like something you'd hear in a mountain hollow, especially A.C. Overton's rolling banjo on House Carpenter, which conjures up an image of someone holding forth from a rocking chair on the porch of a shack in deepest Appalachia, except this particular music didn't come from North Carolina's mountain country. Overton didn't live in Deep Gap. He lived near Garner. And it turns out there's a lot of indigenous old-time music right here in the Triangle, which is why Martin's project bears the title Going Down to Raleigh, String Band Music in the North Carolina Piedmont, 1976 to 1998. The traditional music group Pinecone has released the collection as part of its 25-year anniversary. Yeah, I thought that was true, too, that you had to go to the mountains to find this music, says Martin, who is Senior Program Director of Folk Life at the North Carolina Arts Council. This was uh, several promotions ago, obviously. <laughs> but what I found was that there's an amazing amount of it right around Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill, and it's all pretty much under the radar. I felt like I discovered something important, part of the foundation of who we are in this area culturally. I wanted there to be a record of it. Going down to Raleigh is a snapshot of a time when life in the Triangle moved at a slower pace with a different relationship between the area's cities and the surrounding rural areas. In the days before the Triangle became the bustling high-tech center it is today, more of the local economy was based on farming. As recently as the early 1990s, you'd still see commercials for seeds and farm supplies on local television, including uh, Marshall Wyatt's family. When I moved here in 1967, the Midday Farm Report was a big deal, Martin says. Raleigh was connected to Wilson and Goldsboro and Fuquay in a very different way. Those are now bedroom communities for Raleigh. But back then, they were more tied together through agriculture. That's why we named this Going Down to Raleigh, to symbolize the interaction between farm economies and cities. The musicians I met were all raised in a rural environment as farmers. They were very self-reliant, could fix about anything. And they did music the same way, too. And uh, now I'd like Wayne to talk a little bit more about that. that. Thank you, David. Well, uh, I, I'd forgotten about that interview. So actually, that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> uh, w well, I, I will say this um, without trying to get into a lot of family history, but I grew up in Georgia. We did move here in 1967. Uh, there were no mountains, really, that I was aware of in Georgia, but I was aware in um, my family of people playing uh, country music, singing shape note hymns and playing fiddle music and things like that. And we came to Raleigh. Um, I, uh, it, was a, it was a bit of a culture shock back then uh, to come to Raleigh and it was at first it seemed like a very sort of um, compared to where I was in Georgia sort of an elite place it was felt like it was there were more wealth more wealth and it was the capital city anyway I later decided to try to play music kind of to, in a way to go back and reconnect with those Georgia roots my own family identity and uh, I started to play the fiddle and, and a little on the guitar and I had to learn you had to go find people who played and ask you to sh show you what to do there were of course no camps no the internet you know there's you, there was a record record bar the record bar you could go and buy um, Usually, uh, there were county records and Smithsonian folkways records, and you could try to learn off that, but that was really hard, just listening to a, a record. So, people would um, say, well, you want to learn this music? Well, you need to go to Mount Airy, or you need to go to Galax, and, um, or Madison County, which I did, and those were really wonderful experiences, because there were, North Carolina is full of fantastic musicians from all sorts of communities. But I had people here in Raleigh sending me there, you know, to 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 Western North Carolina. And and that was quite quite educational and wonderful. But um, I, you, you'll get to meet uh, Evelyn Shaw in a few minutes um, or later when after the 
interview part is over and you hear the music. But uh, one one day I was doing a program in the schools and went over to Asheboro, North Carolina. We went to a public school. They called them and said, we want a music program. So um, I did some calling around and I heard there were some string musicians. So I said, well, we'll meet at the school. And when I met there, uh, it was Lachlan Shaw and um, Glenn Davis, the banjo player, and Fred Olson was the guitar player. And they did a great program for this, the school. And when I was leaving, I, uh, the fiddle player, Lachlan Shaw, said, well, would you like to, you should come to our house and so sometime and play some music. And I thought, okay, um, that would be great because he was so good. And I thought we would be going to at least to Salisbury or to, you know, Iredale County where Fiddler's Grove was or whatever, or even further. And I said, well, where do you live? And he said, well, I live just below Raleigh in Harnett County. <laughs> And I said, really? You know, and so, of course, um, my wife Margaret and I, we went and started to uh, meet their family and hear the music, and uh, it was really fantastic. And from there, meeting other people who played um, played music, and um, there were so, so many. Um, A.C. Overton was, who was a, played with Lachlan at one had played with one time and circled back and played with him again, um, was a, a huge influence. Joe and Odell Thompson, uh, Smith McKinnis and Hope County. I mean, the, once, once, once the scales fell from my eyes, all of a sudden it was like, holy smoke. You know, we, we have been blind, you know, here in this area, we've been blind to these treasures. And um, I just, it was just, it was just at that point that it just had to be documented because most of the people who um, I was visiting were, um, except for Marvin Gester, he's still alive and he's um, down near Sanford, but they were all um, 60s, 70s, 80s, and you know they they had learned their repertory uh, and their style. It had been influenced by their local communities, or in many cases, their families. So um, it, that it was capturing, I was really in t really interested in trying to document the uh, styles that, that were had some, um, uh, what would you say, some authenticity that, that, was, that came before records and radio started to change everything. So I was really biased that way, I admit it. You know, it was it was something that I um, I loved and I just was really interested in. So that was, it was a mission to document those folks. So that's what the record, uh, the two CD set of going down to Raleigh um, is really about are people who um, lived out from Raleigh, but they would come in and uh, the, the, the CD is titled that because there's a tune called Going Down to Raleigh. It's a really good dance tune. So most of this, the people I was visiting and what you'll hear, and probably most of you know this already, but this is, a lot of it was social music, dance music. Most of the places I went to hear them play were their homes or, um, you know, occasionally, uh, yeah, I was just talking with uh, AC's daughter, Glenda, where, you know, going to a you pick it strawberry farm and playing music while people were, you know, <laughs> doing that and coming back and paying for their strawberries. I mean, it was really a, it was really that kind of um, venue. There was nothing like, nothing like IBMA. <laughs> <laughs> it is so far from IBMA it will blow your mind <laughs> in the sense that, you know, there was not like, stages everywhere for people to go up and play and all these bands. I mean, it was really integrated more into um, just wh how they, where they were going in their lives. So that, w that was really fun. So anyway, I'll stop there. I don't want to dominate the conversation. But. You, you mentioned Joe Thompson and uh, Justin. I, you guys sort of woodshedded with him and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that experience. Um. Yeah, so this is in 2000, 
2005 or so, 2005, um, I met Joe at the Black Banjo Gathering, and Joe was from Mevin, where he lived for his whole life. And at the time, he was about 87, um, and I got the honor and privilege of sort of studying with the people think of Joe as the last black fiddler. Um, he wasn't. He's, I'm right here. Um, <laughs> and, and there are others. Um, but really, Joe was really at, as, as, as much as he was that. Um, he was really one of the last of the Piedmont fiddlers, um, sort of more than anything else. Um, and I had the opportunity to spend time with Joe, a lot of time with Joe. Uh, we would, much like uh, Wayne saying, like, we played at his house. I mean, that was the place that we played at most often. Um, every Thursday night, that was the sort of standing, was the standing thing that we did. And that had been going on for a long time. We didn't institute that. People just knew to come on Thursday night. If you were going to play music with Joe, Thursday night's the night. And so we just sort of plugged ourselves, me and the other chocolate drops, Rhiannon and Dom. And sometimes other people would come with us as well. Um, How big a gathering was that? It was usually four or five people, um, and Joe's wife, Polly, at, and it had a little dog named Jazzy. Um, <laughs> that was white. Um, and so, yeah, we would just play uh, until we didn't want to play anymore, which was you know, one hour and a half or two hours or so. And we did that for years, and for, <laughs> for a while, we, we toured a little bit with Joe, which was difficult. Um, How so? He was 87, 88, 89. Um, that was not easy. Uh, and it was one, I mean, we went to Seattle with Joe. That was a long trip for somebody. Did, did, did that involve actually driving to Seattle? No, <laughs> goodness gracious, no. Um, but we did go to, but I mean, we went a lot of places. Um, and Joe, like old timers of that generation, was not big on compliments or effusive in terms of you did a good job or anything. You weren't going to hear that. Um, <laughs> the greatest compliment, and maybe the only compliment uh, that I ever heard Joe give me or anybody else was he, we were somewhere, and he turned to somebody else who was not us and said, how do you like my band? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that was, that was like, yeah, we made it. Uh, <laughs> We did it, but it really was a wonderful experience to get to um, play with Joe and you know learn you know Joe's tunes, but not just his tunes. We got to learn about you know, what his life was like and the connections to the rest of his community because it you know in the way that we boost up you know musicians these days or whatever, we sort of tend to take them out of their context and like they're magical creatures who float around and. Joe worked at, was a factory worker and a farmer and a coon hunter and a lot of other things. Um, was deeply embedded in his community. He was a church-going man at the end. Uh, at the beginning, he was. <laughs> See, like people, like when I was like, oh, Joe was so religious at the end. Um, <laughs> so, like, what, when I tell, when I talk about Joe, and, and for people who haven't met him, or for people who only met him in a musical context, like he was a whole person who had all kinds of things going on. Um, he was recorded years ago, um, in in his record, there's a recording of him, an oral history that he gives for the Southern Folklife Collection, in which he talks for about an hour, and he never once mentions playing the fiddle. He's talking about working at White's Furniture Factory. He doesn't mention it at all. Um, it's not until later that folks figure out that he, he actually is a fiddle player. Um, so it's like that, the ability to have that kind of experience with somebody who uh, played music as a part of their daily life. Um, it wasn't, you know, later, of course, he got on the stage and played at Merle Fest and all sorts of other places um, and was happy to do it. Um, and that was sort of, uh, a thing that sort of happened at the end. Yeah, you all made a record at, at Merle Fest. Mm -hmm, we did. Mm -hmm. That was uh, great. I've I've forgotten a lot of the stuff that we've done, but uh, and then Joe and but Joe also was sort of because he was sort of the last one of not only of of the region and but he's also the last of his family. 
Um, and so he was sort of like a, a little unicorn of sorts um, because all of his other, his family members all played as well. And so he was sort of like the last, the, like the last one. So it was a little bit um, kismet or something um, that we sort of got to meet Joe at that particular moment. So when he was still in good enough health to play and to pass on and felt uh, happy to do that. And, you know, when, when he'd be, t it was how formal was the teaching? Was it like, you know, you, you do that chord like this or just, <laughs> just start playing and you had to kind of keep up? Yeah, I, I call that teaching in the old way, where you learn by doing. Um, the instruction is watch and then do it, which is um, no, there's no stopping and starting to do it. Like, this is the thing, do the thing. Like... As I, I, I incorporate that a lot. I teach music now, and I incorporate that style of teaching into my style a lot. You don't need, I don't need to talk to you about this. Just play. Um, and it does a world of good. Do you have a performance of any sort coming up, nope. by the way? Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, another important part of sort of bluegrass and old time history around this area involves uh, the radio. And uh, I'm just gonna start with, with Tommy and uh, some of the stuff that went on on WPTF way back when and some of the other local lore. Uh, yeah, I don't wanna, Marshall, is that what you're gonna cover as well? But I, Only 1936. Okay. <laughs> well, 1936 you was a key out. year. <laughs> um, I grew up here and, and lived, was born, um, my family lives in Chapel Hill, and I was born in 1952, which happened to be the year that Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs uh, had sort of a residency at WPTF. Uh, they were here almost the whole year. I think this is where Earl Scruggs worked on or invented the banjo tuners that he made that would do that stuff. Um, but I think how this ties into the history of this region is that there was a huge audience for this music here. And all of you smart people know that Nashville didn't become Music City until later, like late 40s, maybe early 50s is when they started calling it that. Because at one time, Cincinnati and Dallas and certainly Chicago and a number of other towns had really Charlotte. vibrant. Charlotte, yeah, WBT. Atlanta, absolutely. They did a lot of recording in Atlanta. Um, but it, just, it happened that in 1936, um, the, the founder of bluegrass music, Bill Monroe, and his brother Charlie came uh, to Raleigh and were here for a while, for a couple of years. And I found stuff in the News and Observer where they would play, it may not have been a pie supper, but it was something very much like that. Because they played on the radio twice a day, and then they'd go out at night and play gigs, and then they played just whatever anybody wanted to come through, come to, including a benefit for the Louisville flood of 1937, which I thought was interesting. But um, so they were here actually before the birth of what we now call bluegrass music. They broke up here and Bill went on his way and um, actually founded his band in 1939 and uh, premiered what is now called bluegrass music in 1945. But um, the other band that was here was the Stanley Brothers, who were one of the great um, mountain-influenced, old-timey-influenced bands, so that Ralph didn't like to call his music bluegrass. I once said he evasively called it the mountain music style of what they call bluegrass music. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of this I, did, I was not aware of until much later. I mean, growing up here, I there was people who played all around. Um, I'm proud to see members of the Southern String Band here tonight, and I met one of their members, Wade Smith, at my church, and he was playing music in 64 and 65, probably playing the banjo, and Doc Watson would come to town, and then the New Deal boys were here, and I spent a lot of time in Chapel Hill and played with Tommy Thompson and Al McCandless, and this was all before I went to Nashville and started learning more about bluegrass music, Play for a while, eventually became a journalist. So it's all kind of tied together in my life. The, the music of this area and um, how it developed and my eventually becoming a 
somewhat a chronicle of it, of it including a book that's coming out in <laughs> September called <laughs> Earl Scruggs and Foggy Mountain Breakdown, The Making of an American Classic, a title I did not come up with. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want anything else from me? <laughs> Uh, let's let's move on to Marshall. And uh, back in the 1930s, there was a thing here called Crazy Barn Dance that I think you're quite the authority on. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about WPTF Radio and a program called the Crazy Barn Dance. Um, I've got a few exhibits over here, um, including a vintage 19, uh, well, a WPTF microphone that was first introduced in 1938, right when the Monroe Brothers were here. Charlie and Bill may have sung into that very microphone. Um, it's not currently working, but uh, <laughs> we could get it DNA tested for saliva. Let's do a swab, yeah. There's also a WPTF souvenir uh, booklet, which you can't see unless you come up here later, uh, 20 pages of information about a lot of the bands that played on the station. Um, I'm going to read from some notes, so I hope you'll just bear with me. Um, here in Raleigh in the mid-1930s, it was fashionable to go downtown in the evening, down to the 300 block of Fayetteville Street, and have dinner at the S&W cafeteria. The S&W was located on the ground floor of the old Pullen building right next door to the Wake County Courthouse. Unlike a lot of cafeterias today, the S&W was a fancy upscale restaurant and a very popular place to eat in Raleigh. So, say it's 1936 and you've just finished a fine meal at the S&W, and now to round out the evening, you decide to go out and hear some live music. To do that, you do not have to go very far. When you exit the restaurant, just walk to the north end of the building and go around the corner. There you'd see a cobblestone alley that ran between the Pullen building and the courthouse next door. Walk down the alley about half the length of the Pullen building and you'll see a door with letters overhead, WPTF. Go right in, it's open to the public. Once inside, you'd see one flight of stairs going down. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, there it would be, the headquarters, the bustling nerve center of WPTF radio. The station was owned by the Durham Life Insurance Company, as was the entire building, and the call letters WPTF reflected the company's motto, we protect the family. The station was in the renovated basement of the building below street level directly underneath the S&W cafeteria where you just had dinner. The first thing you'd see was a spacious lobby well appointed with couches and chairs. From the lobby you could look through large glass windows into the studios to see who was broadcasting at the time. And there were speakers in the lobby so you could also hear the broadcasts. WPTF had three studios, A, B, and C. Studio C was tiny with just enough room for two turntables and one chair. This is where a technician would play large 16-inch transcription discs. WPTF relied mostly on live broadcasts, but there were a few time slots where they'd play a pre-recorded program. Studio B was an all-purpose studio used mostly for newscasts, farm reports, and interviews. Studio A was the big one featuring a stage across one end of the room that could accommodate 15 musicians or more. And there was seating for a studio audience. So if you came down to the station and got a seat in Studio A, depending on day and time, you might hear classical music from the sedate Neapolitan String Trio. Or you might get to hear local celebrity Kingham Scott playing the Muller pipe organ. But if this was 1936 and you came down to Studio A on a Saturday night around 9 p.m., you'd be just in time for the weekly live broadcast of the Crazy Barn Dance. This was a one-hour program of hillbilly music, as it was called in those days. And in my opinion, it was some of the best hillbilly music on the airwaves. The show was called the Crazy Barn Dance because it was sponsored by a patent medicine called Crazy Water Crystals. 
The crystals were made by a Texas company, and unlike many businesses, they were hugely successful during the Great Depression. Crazy Water's primary mode of advertising was radio, and they sponsored hundreds of programs all across the United States and Canada, mostly hillbilly music. I think it would be fair to say that the company's success relied mostly on two things, hillbilly music and blatant false advertising. <laughs> they claimed the crystals could cure practically every ailment known to man from the common cold to cancer. It was all lies, of course, but they got away with it, with it for about five years. The headline act on the Crazy Barn Dance was J.E. Maynard's Mountaineers, one of the great string bands of the 1930s. These guys were playing folk music in overdrive about 25 years before Alan Lomax invented that phrase. The Mountaineers also featured the duet singing of Wade Maynard and Zeke Morris, who had a huge hit record at the time, Maple on the Hill. Zeke Morris later recalled as they sang the song, he could see folks in the audience with tears rolling down their faces. One time the ovation was so great that they had to sing Maple on the Hill four times in a row before they could move on with the program. Next on the Crazy Barn Dance, you might see the Dixon brothers, Howard and Dorsey, one of the most significant brother duets of the 1930s. And perhaps they performed some of Dorsey Dixon's compelling original songs based on real life events, such as Weave Room Blues, I Didn't Hear Nobody Pray, or The Schoolhouse Fire. Then on the program, you might see the Leatherman sisters, Lucille, Lillian, and Kate, with their Gibson guitars and harmony vocals coming all the way from Hickory to be on the program. And then you might even get to hear James B. Grotty from Sampson County playing traditional fiddle tunes of Eastern North Carolina. Grotty would be the senior musician on the program about two generations older than most of the other performers. Before the Mainers return for a grand finale, the Johnston County Ramblers might take the stage. This was a four-piece string band led by a tobacco farmer named Paul Bird. And there was a young mandolinist in the band uh, named James Thornton. Some of you probably remember Jim Thornton since he was a well-known Raleigh personality in later years who called himself the Barefoot Boy from Benson. Uh, for, a long, for a long time, he ran Jim Thornton's Dance Club um, out at the end of South Saunders Street. And he had a TV show on WTVD Durham called Saturday Night Country Style, which was a live country music show, kind of like an updated version of the Crazy Barn Dance. Paul Bird had a long career in music and broadcasting, most of it centered around eastern North Carolina. And no, he was not an important figure in the development of bluegrass music. But at WPTF, he did rub shoulders with those who were, including the Mainers, the Dixons, and the Monroe brothers. Um, so now, um, I want to show a short slideshow with music. And what you're going to hear is a solo recording uh, that Paul Bird did called Going Crazy. And he's not actually singing about crazy water crystals. But he did record the song just about the same time he was performing on the Crazy Barn Dance. Uh, so this is not bluegrass music, but it is from eastern North Carolina. So let's see if this works. <laughs> Walked into a dry goods store to get me a pair of shoes. Then how the side of war so walked out with the blues. I'm going crazy. Don't you want to go along home? I'm going crazy from singing this song. Went to see my girl last night. She met me at the door. Shoes and stockings in her hand and a beat all over the floor. I'm going crazy. Don't you want to go long home? I'm going crazy from singing this song. 
Went to kiss my girl last night, had to do it sneaking. I missed her mouth and kissed her nose, and the doggone thing was leaking. Going crazy, don't you want to go long? I'm going crazy from singing this song. The old lady come into the room, and the old man, he did too. When they got through it, this face of mine, boys, it's black and blue. I'm going crazy, don't you want to go long? I'm going crazy from singing this song. The old man grabbed the old shotgun, he ain't got a lick of sense. He said, see to my pants far when I went over the fence. I'm going crazy, don't you want to go long? I'm going crazy from singing this song. Went down to Asheville and took a shot at me. When they took their second shot, I was going through Tennessee. I'm going crazy, don't you want to go long? I'm going crazy from singing this song. This is my song I've been singing to you. I'm going to stop now and tell you I'm through. I'm going crazy. Don't you want to go long? I'm going crazy from singing this song. There you have it. So, so Marshall, you've, you've been working on um, a box set about Crazy Barn Dance for a number of years, correct? Rome was not built in a day, David. <laughs> I, I know I'm not the only one who really, really wants this to exist. So uh, if there's anybody out there who wants to bankroll that. <laughs> there you go. You, you can be my uh, fundraiser. There you go. So what became of Crazy Water Crystals? Uh, the Food and Drug Administration basically shut them down. <laughs> it took them a long time to do it, too. They, they started trying to shut them down in 1933, but uh, the company was so connected politically, they could get through all of these different loopholes, and they lasted. They did really well until 1937, and finally things started going downhill, and then a bunch of cease and desist orders came, and it sort of, by World War II, it was pretty much gone. And that took the show with it, I guess. Yeah, the Crazy Barn Dance, actually, um, the last broadcast was in January of 1937. And three weeks later is when the Monroe Brothers came to Raleigh. Um, but the Monroe Brothers had already played on the Crazy Barn Dance when it was in Charlotte earlier. So. They kind of followed it from Iowa, right? They're out there um, performing in the Midwest, having been in... Chicago, and there was sort of a circuit of crazy water locations, right? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they were sponsored by a company called Texas Crystals when they were out in the Midwest. This was a crazy water competitor. <laughs> and Texas Crystals, they sold you a bi bigger box for the same dollar. That was Every a big thing. <laughs> Everything's bigger in Texas. They sent <laughs> They sent the Monroe brothers to Columbia, South Carolina in August of 1935. And about three weeks later, Texas Crystals folds and, and cancels the show and cancels the sponsorship. And the Monroe brothers were stuck there in Columbus, uh, in Columbia. And um, about a week later, Crazy Water Crystals, uh, the man who ran it here in the Carolinas, J.W. Fincher, he had been listening to the Monroe Brothers already, and he knew how great they were, and so he signed them up for Crazy Water Crystals. So they just went from Texas to, to crazy. <laughs> it's not a far journey, man. <laughs> there you go. So um, I, I think this might be a good point to uh, see if anybody out there has any questions. If you do, I'd like you to come forward and speak into the mic. Anybody? Oh, come on, got to be somebody. What were crazy water crystals? Okay, they, were, they came from Mineral Wells, Texas, which was a resort area with all these different wells that had healing waters. And people would come from all over the country to bathe and drink the waters. And one of the wells there was known as the Crazy Well. It was named after a 
crazy woman from the 1880s who drank from the waters and was miraculously cured. So the crazy well lasted on up, you know, into the 1920s and 30s, and then the uh, Collins brothers out of Dallas purchased it um, just right at the time the Depression hit, and so they had to come up with some new gimmick to really sell product. And so rather than go to mineral wells, they figured, well, we'll evaporate the water out of the mineral water, and then there'll only be the minerals, the crystals, and then we can box them up and ship them out all over the country and all over the world, and that's what they did. And basically, they were like a mild laxative. That's all they did. <laughs> they would not cure diabetes like they claimed, you know. So that's, that's about it. They were, they were salt crystals. <laughs> so we're, do any, are, are there any buildings still standing like where the, you know, Bill and Charlie Monroe and the likes of them lived? Yeah, what's well, now the Wake County building. It's an office building that has the election commission and I used to cover stuff there all the time. And Marshall and I went with Kurt Eichenberger who knew a whole lot about that building. And we got to see these little corners where you could still see part of a room that they had worked in. And there was a big room downstairs that they used um, to put big mainframe computers in when you needed these giant things to store information. And you could kind of look in there and see down towards one end where the stage was, where they performed. That was the big studio. So it's right there. I mean, it was you could walk there in two minutes from the paper. But there's nothing left of it. I always thought there should at least be a historical marker or something. And they could. I think they could probably go in and somehow fix it up again so it had some resemblance to the... So another fundraiser. There you go. <laughs> Oh, Fillmore Street. Oh, yeah. Um, I believe I may have discovered this, but someone did. Uh, they, we always had city directories at the paper, and I knew that Bill Monroe had lived here, so I went to 36 or 37. Sure enough, it was so detailed. It's like William S. Monroe, wife Carolyn, daughter Melissa, and then it was radio, I think it said radio reporter or something kind of odd. But it was 1201 Fillmore Street, which in the house is still there. Marshall and some folks went over and did a, a video there. But, yeah, I think it was probably, I think Bill may have taken the uh, streetcar downtown because it was right on the streetcar line. And then the, the, it's not there anymore, but where uh, Charlie lived was down kind of catty corner to um, Memorial Auditorium. When did he could walk to the station easily. Yeah, yeah he could easily walk. Here's, here's a, a Raleigh old-timer question. When did the streetcar go away? How late was that there till? Mm. Do you have any memory of it? Or, there's still a, a, what is that thing over there on Oberlin, I mean on uh, Linwood? There's still a little shelter that people sat in, I think. Oh, on, yeah, on Glenwood Avenue yeah. at uh, Harvey Street. Yeah. yeah. I don't know exactly when. Uh, okay. You know, there was the famous Bloomsbury Park, and there was a whole sort of um, there were developments built around the streetcar because they yeah. wanted to have a, a suburb. suburb. And you all mentioned historical markers. It seems like Joe Thompson really needs to have a historical marker. Have you ever thought about Justin, you know, spearheading something like that? Um, he's, if you go to Mevin, um, there's actually a statue being put up of him. In, oh, a statue is really mm -hmm. in the works. Great. Um, it should be done by this summer, but you know, you know how that stuff goes. Um, and there's Joe Thompson Day in Mebane. Um Yeah, there there could be a historical marker. I don't know if I'm the right one, the person to head that up, but yeah, that's a good idea. Just out of curiosity, do you know the artist who did the statue? I met him, but I can't tell okay. you his name. Yeah. Uh, I'm oh, Dave, sorry. can I mention one more thing? Yeah, um, please. Sort of vis-a-vis -vis IBMA and the history of this music. I and mean, these guys, they did okay. The Monroe Brothers sold a bunch of records, and Flatt and Scruggs were doing pretty well. Um, the Sandys never did quite as well as the other foundational acts. Um, but they were brilliant, brilliant musicians who made this incredible new style based very much, as Marshall said, on Mainers, Mountaineers, and um, the Morris Brothers. All, all of these acts were sort of on the very cusp of bluegrass, 
but Bill Monroe and Earl Scruggs were pretty much the, the two driving forces towards what we call bluegrass music today. But at that time, bluegrass was not notably successful. I mean, it was another country music form. I think if any bluegrass record ever sold 50,000 copies, I would be surprised to hear it. Um, but at the same time, it's persisted through the years, through some very difficult times, through times when you know acoustic music was not really in favor. But this area has kept up with it. I mean, there's always been bluegrass here as far as I know. I mean, I know guys have been playing it for 50 and 60 years. And now bluegrass has become a thing. It's a huge thing all over the world. And people do sell, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies and make a good living at it. I remember a, a guy that I'd known years ago, somebody approached him about being in one of the touring bands. And, and the guy said, can you make a living at that? Because at one time you could not. I mean, even the side men of Bill Monroe, who was notoriously not, you know, bounteous with his pay, but uh, Kenny Baker used to go back to the mines and work. The great, great fiddler would go and work um, in mining in Kentucky to be able to afford to go back and play with Bill some more. So there was intense dedication to this music, and I think this area, I mean, any bluegrass band would tell you they're here a lot. I mean, they come through a lot because there's support for this music. So that the history that, you know, we've talked about of the string bands in Harnett County and down that way and in Mebane, and um, the appetite for this music has never gone away in North Carolina. And that has been, I think, at least partially responsible for the long-term survival. And now the uh, very much the kind of the triumph of bluegrass music as a big segment of... Um, I mean, it's not big compared to country music or any of the big, big styles, but it's definitely thriving. Um, in the book, I compare it to, to Dixieland. I mean, there, at one time there was wonderful, what they call traditional jazz in New Orleans, and then it kind of turned into Dixieland. And as far as I'm aware, there's not a big audience for that music now. I mean, if you go to New Orleans, if you go to certain towns, you can hear the bands play, but there's not, you know, the International Dixieland Music Association having a big conference uh, every year and drawing hundreds of thousands of people. Okay, that's my sermon. And I'd just like to note, by the way, that uh, Tommy has totally outclassed us on the sock front. Everybody should, everybody should totally take a look at those before you leave tonight. They're, they're pretty impressive, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I kind of cut off the questions. Are, are there more out there? Anybody else? Yes. The question is, what is what is the Piedmont? Who wants to take that one? I'll take it. So the Piedmont is basically uh, Morganton and West, um, and physiographically, uh, it ends in Raleigh. Raleigh is sort of the beginning of the coastal plain. So the Piedmont is really where all the biggest towns in North Carolina are. So Greensboro, Charlotte, Raleigh, all that. Um, it literally, literally means foot of the mountains. So when people say that Piedmont is a sort of a, a cultural thing that people are talking about, but also like a physiographic, like a geological like things that are happening. Um, but sort of culturally, the Piedmont, physiographically, really like Morganton area, that's where it starts. Culturally, I would say it probably st starts in Shelby, Gastonia, something like that. Yeah, When I titled the CD, I titled it Music of the Piedmont to distinguish it from the mountains because I wanted to make a point. But uh, uh, I don't know if, if Evelyn Shaw will corroborate this story or not, but when I was talking to her dad, who Lachlan Shaw about being on the recording, I said something about music of the Piedmont, and he kind of said, well, this is music of the Sandhills. <laughs> 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 so, so it was another, another time when some, you know, kind of my, from my perspective, it was sort of like I was 
trying to make a point, but I think his point might have been better. I mean, in the sense that with that generation of people, so much was local. <laughs> it was so focused on local, um, and they they could they distinguish things that, to a fine point rather than just kind of you know saying Piedmont Mountain. So. Yes, that's true. Yeah, it's the, the one when I was uh, doing work down in Onslow County, which is on the coast. I found <laughs> ran into more old time fiddlers than <laughs> any place except for Mount Airy, North Carolina. So it was ubiquitous. I think this tradition of playing fiddle music uh, across the state. Um, I think you know, uh, going back. Into uh, to the to the roots of it. I mean, uh, to me, it's there's so many strands. Like Lachlan Shaw's family came from a, a branch came from Scotland, and you know, A.C. Overton's family was from Granville County that had come down to this region. But throughout it all, I, I kept feeling like uh, you know that we had to dispel this this notion that this was British Isles music because so much of it is a, is where African American and uh, mixed with other cultures and came up with something that's totally what I think is really unique. If you listen to the old music, it really has a phrasing uh, and that that and a, and a scales and and ways of thinking about the music that I think is really unique. You won't find it other places. You don't find that, in the, I, I don't think, in the British Isles. It's different. It sounds different. It is different. <laughs> and a lot of the tunes that people attributed to being uh, British Isles tunes actually are not. They're, they're from minstrel shows, and they're from um, other, way, other places where people were trying to imitate what they heard um, in plantations and among uh, uh, African American communities, so it's it really is that the tr the truer story is much more interesting <laughs> than than the what we what we often hear and what you can kind of see a, a lot of times when you look at a documentary film or on TV and you, it, it kind of hits the surface, but it doesn't really get down to what maybe the truth is. How about one more question, and then we're going to play some music. I'll talk about WPTF and then maybe um, pass the mic along. Um, the studios were generally open to the public, and I have never in my research found any testimony that um, addressed specifically could African Americans come in just as well as whites. I don't know, and it's possible that the segregation was so entrenched that most of the black folks just figured, well, we're not going to be welcome there and just didn't bother to go. But I really, I really don't know, and it's a really good question, and I'd like to know more about exactly that. Um, the question about influence and sort of how did this music come about, um, the one thing to remember is that North Carolina, first of all, is indigenous land, and as Europeans came to this place, the second the Europeans got to what is now the political boundaries of North Carolina, there were African people with them immediately. Not a second wave, not two years later, the second they stepped across the political lines that are African people were right beside there. That's the story of my family, that's the story of many other families. And so when we talk about sort of like sort of black and white and that sort of thing, it, they've, in this country, in this state, they've always done this. It's always been one and the other. There's never been like, well, they came and then, nope. Those are myths. So, 
what happens when you put people together. It doesn't matter what enmities that there are, whatever. So when you get people together, they start to become like each other. That is just, they start to eat each other's food. They start to make babies with each other, whether they hate each other's guts or not. That's just how, that's just how. Right, and musicians are often very quick studies. Um, and so what you're going to find is that people are going to be sort of sneaking around, even with whatever the, whatever the social mores are of the time, and people are going to play music with each other. Also remember that, you know, we think about this idea of like the plantation master or whatever. That was only one person in the whole plantation system. There were other people around. There were the, there was the overseer. There were poor whites who lived around, uh, landowners who only had a few slaves or no slaves. And so people were mixing together in a whole kind of a way that is not necessarily from this sort of the single master in the big house and the slaves who lived in the enslaved people who lived in the quarters. So it was a lot more going on than 12 years a slave or roots or whatever is sort of painting these pictures to be. It's a complicated system because there are people involved. Um, and for the most part, uh, much to what Wayne is saying, that this, that these sort of, you know, I've heard, I've listened to all the British Isles tunes too, and sometimes I can hear the, sometimes I can hear the the, the similarities, and often I can't, um, because it is it is a music that is based on a, a, a cup, many cultures coming together um, to form something brand new. But your question about could folks attend the 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 radio station, probably not. I mean, they wouldn't have gone in there. That wouldn't have made any sense. Um, and like the Fiddler's Convention and stuff, black people weren't allowed to compete. Um, and so all of this stuff was segregated. All, everything, 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 everything you can think of, beaches, car washes, restaurants, everything. Just believe that is true. Um, and so, and people still find ways to like, play at each other's houses. There were bands that were integrated, a few and far between. There are funny stories about bands who people they'd only heard recordings of and they didn't know which race they were. So <laughs> there were, you know, Uncle Dave Macon, people thought Uncle Dave Macon was black. Um, there was another band who, there was, oh, I can't remember the band, but people thought that they were black so they didn't get booked and they were actually white. Uh, Jimmy Rogers, people thought Jimmy Rogers was black. <laughs> so that tells you something about the kind of music he was singing. Go, and just a little snippet for you country music buffs, go back and listen to, to Emmett Miller, and then listen to Jimmy Rogers. Emmett Miller was a minstrel performer. Then listen to Jimmy Rogers. Do it in that order. Emmett Miller, Jimmy Rogers. It will be an uh, education for you. And it persisted for a very long time. Um, the Embers, the beach band, early on they had an African-American horn player. And uh, their drummer told me a story about how a club owner asked him, you know, you have someone in your band who's black? He said, no, sir, he's Puerto Rican. <laughs> and they, they played the gig and it went fine, he said. <laughs> All right, all right we, I, I think uh, we're at the point where we need to clear out and let them play some music. So we're going to take about very quickly to uh, get the microphone set up, but stand by. Thank you.
we ready? All right. So, um, would you uh, please make welcome uh, Evelyn Shaw, daughter of Lachlan Shaw. And Jerry Overton, son of A.C. Overton. Both of whom are, have, are highly featured on the uh, Going Down to Raleigh CDs. And then playing the banjo is Margaret Martin. Please make her welcome. So we're going to be playing tunes from um, uh, Evelyn and, and um, Jerry's families. And these are old, the older dance tunes. So we're going to play three or four and then maybe do a, a song. And we'll try to get Justin out on, on one of these pieces. So, so we're gonna, uh, what are we going to start out with? So we're in D, right? Are, okay. Do you want to say a little bit about um, where you first heard this tune? I think it was interesting. You were telling me about it the other day, Mississippi Sawyer. Oh, gosh. When, when did I first hear well, this when, tune? Yeah. When you were little and they would take you to the... Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. When, um, when I was little, um, we went to... My dad would play some, like, square dances. And square dances then were in, like, people's maybe pack house or could have been in um, something like uh, American Legion Hut. I know there were dances at the American Legion Hut in, in Lillington. I have two sisters out in the audience, and they can probably shout out something somewhere else where they might have been. Coon Hunters Associations, you know. So anyway, you know, with three kids, um, and I was the youngest, you know, that basically we went along to some of those dances because... Um, you know, we didn't have baby, we didn't have babysitters, you know, back then, uh, or apps that could get you a babysitter, so uh, or find one, you know. But anyway, we would go along to dances, and you know, with us little ones, you know, that would be me and Marie, and I guess Carolyn, you might have been a little bit older, teenager. I I don't know if you went to many of those or not, but probably some, yeah. But anyway, we would, uh, you know, my dad would be playing in, you know. A band there for square dancing and and the caller would be dancing right along with everybody else so they're calling and dancing at the same time so this is one of the you know tunes that he would play and uh, hope you enjoy it Thank you. 
So, Jerry, talk a little bit about, you said it, uh, the other day that you also uh, have a connection with, everyone's talking about pack houses, but tobacco and... Uh, yeah, we, when I was a small child back in the mid-60s, we would go to pack houses, in particular at uh, Watkins Crossroads, which is just on the outskirts of town. But back then, it was a long ways out of town. Uh, Raleigh ran out about uh, where the music center and uh, Sam Ash is now. But uh, back then, Raleigh was... Uh, kind of confined, it was kind of a small, a much smaller town, and going to Watkins Farm back then was a long, long ways out, whereas now it's nothing. But uh, anyway, we would go there uh, in particular, and Watkins Crossroads, and there would be on, I think it was probably during the fall after tobacco was done, and we would have barn dances and pack houses and there would probably be at least 30 people there on a given night, at least 30. And they would just move everything out and there'd be square dance, uh, a big old time, people hooting and hollering and they would have the drink coolers over there and I would get my little knee high out of the bottle with the grape, uh, the grape uh, knee high soda. And it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful time of, of a time that's just long gone now, but really gives me heartwarming memories as a child to uh, my dad and Derwood Atkinson and others, some of the Watkins I think played and uh, they would play fired up for several hours a night mm -hmm. and it was a lot of fun. <clears throat> well, play, why don't we play the one you, you said you liked, uh, Ricketts Hornpipe? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Okay. Ricketts Hornpipe. Did either of your parents give you f lessons? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I... Uh, not really. <laughs> no. No, I didn't really start playing until I was like 27. So, um, of course, I heard it 
you know, all, all my life, but I didn't really care for it there for a period of time, you know. About 26 years. Yeah, right, about 26 years. Well, when I was little, you know, my dad would um, let me, and he probably did this with the, with my sisters too, Marie and Carolyn would, he would um, let us like hold the bow and we'd do like, we would saw the bow basically and he'd do like maybe pop goes the weasel or something like that. But not really, um, when I got interested in it, he, uh, he made some tapes for me, which was great. And he gave me one of his fiddles and just like at his tobacco barns and his um, oil, the, the, uh, where you had the fuel, the oil for the uh, fluke barns, you know, they have tanks. He put his initials on the fiddle. <laughs> so that gave me the impression that if it didn't work out, it was going back to him, right? I knew where to take it, right? Yeah, I knew where to take it. But, you know, he was very encouraging and um, actually in a lot of ways pushed me. I think, Jerry, you had a similar kind of thing where, he, you know, my dad yeah. would say stuff like, bear down on it. Bear down <laughs> on it, you know, don't play so soft, but go ahead. Yeah, uh, no, I, I wasn't interested in this kind of music at first. I guess I was so saturated with it that it didn't really hit home with me. I wanted to listen to The Doors and the Almond Brothers, which I still like The Doors Jerry, and the Almond Brothers. weren't you in the Battle of the Bands one day? I was in the oh, Battle yeah. of the Bands for like three years, uh, a group called Yield. <laughs> we yielded to all the other groups in the area. <laughs> but... uh Anyway, I, I do kick myself over and over again for not paying attention as a child and learning my dad's two-finger banjo technique because it was uh, so unique and it's going back in, in later years and listening to him and trying to learn it in later years, I couldn't really learn it. It was so different. Yeah. I had a hard time picking up on it. You do a great job with it. Yeah, you do, Margaret. You really do. I listened to him a lot, yeah, and playing guitar behind him, but, it, you know, it wasn't until, really until he passed that I started just kind of thinking, kind of like, you know, he, was, he owned it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I started appreciating it about 50, really, really appreciating it about 15 or 20 years before yeah. he passed on, and, but by then, I just could not, I couldn't pick up what he was doing. He was going backwards and forwards with that His thumb. His thumb would and go back and forth. I couldn't. It sounded simple, but when you try to do it, I couldn't do it. So, yeah. uh, Lachlan was a real uh, master at seconding, and Evelyn could do a little bit of that. So we want to try one, a waltz for you. Yep. Make sure it's the right one, right? <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's our, yeah.
So somebody needs to give us the time. How much time do we have? And what what do we go to? We got five minutes. Oh, okay. So we better get Justin out here to do one. Oh, waiting in the wings yeah. here. Just here. Yeah. Okay. And then we're, we're going to try to do two more. We're going to do one with Justin and then get Tommy out here to finish up. So it's you need a mic. Or no, well, these might these might pick up. Thank you for being here and being such a great audience. We're going to get Tommy to come out, and um, we're going to end with one that's on the Going Back to Raleigh CD. It's called Light at the Window, and it, um, it just just a magic day. Uh, Jerry said, AC had told me, he said, there's a, there's a man that lives out at, uh, up at Sandy Plain. Do you know where Sandy Plain is in the northern part of Wake County going toward, I guess, Oxford? He said, He's, he's, he's the only person I've ever met that plays the same tunes as my um, uncle, who was older, right? Yes. So uh -huh. AC and I went up there, and I brought the tape recorder, and just that one day, we recorded several pieces and uh, that were I'd never heard before, and Light in the Window was one of them, Railroad was another. <sighs> yes. 
great songs. Both great songs, and that AC had played when he was young, and Jack was the only other person here, Jack Jones. So we're going to do Light at the Window now and try and get Tommy to sing it. How you want to do that? Is that, is that going to work? Yeah, yeah, we'll get him. We'll get him close to him. Yeah. 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 I'll get right into that mic. Yeah. Yeah. More on you, man. <laughs> Now 